Hey, what's up everyone? And well, there are several movies that released that I anticipated for 2024. So, I'd say, what the hell? Might as well get them all done in one shot. Well, three of them to be exact. That's right, we're not killing not one, not two, but three birds with one stone. March Madness is what I call it. Because, yeah, they were released three consecutive weeks in the end of March, leaving towards April, which is what it is now as I'm making this video. And, well, also I should mention, there's going to be some spoilers in this. So if you don't want any spoilers whatsoever, then turn the video off right now. Otherwise, our first stop is DreamWorks and Universal's Kung Fu Panda 4. Yes, I enjoyed the hell out of the first one. I thought it laid the ground almost perfectly with the voice of Jack Black and a bunch of other voice actors that you know in the film. And the animation was gorgeous, kung fu action. It's a family-friendly type of movie, and DreamWorks really had a major hit back in 2008. Wow. It's been 16 years since the first one came out, and this franchise is still going on. The second one, released in 2011, I think did even better. The animation was great, villain was great, and the backstory, well, definitely got you a little teary-eyed, to be exact. I mean, it's not the first time and only time DreamWorks ever did this. But, yeah. Right next to Shrek 2, this was a fantastic sequel. Then the third one, which was of course hinted at the end of the second one, was good, but not as good. You know, it was fun and entertaining, but again, kind of a bit of a step down. It's not as bad as Shrek the third, but it still kind of took the series back a little bit. You know, you expected more and you didn't really get it. So, I didn't know what to expect out of a fourth one, but here it is. You probably saw the teasers, and you probably saw the trailers, and you know the story. Jack Black reprises his role, respectively, as Poe, the overweight kitchen shop worker and kung fu expert, who unfortunately is told by his master, voiced by Dustin Hoffman, coming back to reprise that role as well, as his real father, voiced by Brian Cranston, and his adoptive father, who of course runs the kitchen. So yeah, he's stuck between two different worlds once again, you know, fighting and running the kitchen and everything like that. And he has to pass the torch on to a newcomer. He's not enthusiastic about doing that, so this opens a lot of opportunities. But unfortunately, most of the side characters you remember, you know, the snake, the monkey, and the tiger, I'm not completely down with that, but... You know, it's great to see some new faces, which one of the newcomers is voiced by Aquafina. You know, she's a typical over-the-top comedic relief and everything like that, and she steals the staff, and of course is working for our main antagonist villain, the chameleon voiced by Viola Davis. I think she really kills that role. So, how's the movie hold up in general? It's good, but... Yeah, it's not as good as the first two films. I can't say I really expected it to be. I mean, it's been receiving mixed to mildly positive reactions. So, are there any good things about this one? Well, I saw it in 3D. The animation is gorgeous once again. There are some good, silly, comedic elements. I mean, it's a kid's movie nonetheless. I like the new places it goes to, like when he has to travel along this con artist character voiced by Aquafina, because, yeah... He's trying to find a newcomer and, of course, has to try to take on the chameleon. And it does become a bit predictable. I mean, even though she's working for the chameleon, you know, she's just going to turn on her and help Poe. And I like the town with all the outlaws and everything like that. You know, how they try to round them up and everything and get them to take on this main villain. I like the idea of the main villain herself summoning all these past villains from the past films. I thought that was really cool. And it could have really went into a big, epic showdown, the big direction, but unfortunately it felt a little underwhelming. The film ended up being a little predictable, enjoyable for the most part, but I felt like it was a little rushed towards the end. They could have done more with this. I mean, there's plenty of silly humor, some gorgeous animation, so... Don't let that get you down. I know this movie made a lot of money. I mean, DreamWorks is, and Universal especially have done really well for themselves. I mean, Disney really needs to start picking themselves up. And we can only hope that there's a lot better for them over the horizon this year. So, yeah. Other than that, I can safely say this is a pretty good film. It's nothing more than a fourth film, an add-on to the series. I mean, I can't say I'm expecting and excited for any more of these films in the franchise that's been going on for 16 years. I mean, what more do you expect? Sometimes you make too many sequels, you run a franchise into the ground, just like Shrek and all these other animated franchises that just need to stop already. 
But if you're looking for a kid-friendly movie and a good hour and a half to spend with kids, then go for it. It's not a bad movie. You see it in 3D, it's nice and everything like that. But otherwise, it's not as good as the first two. You want my opinion? Just watch those two. Those are the best in the franchise. But I enjoyed it for what it was. But I think it's time for this franchise to take a nice long meditation. But other than that, I give it just a plain two weird emotes up. A good fun kung fu kick-ass, but just mildly entertaining animated film out of DreamWorks. So, next film, let's suit up. Yep, for Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, the fourth entry in this franchise. No, we don't include that 2016 abomination, let's not even talk about that one. But yes, Ghostbusters is one of the most beloved horror comedy franchises of all time. Nothing will ever top the 1984 film. It's an all-time classic. The second film is not as good, the typical sequel, but I think it's very underrated and very enjoyable. You know, a little bit darker. So, after all the years of being kicked around with the third film, even with the 2009 video game, which got a remastering for the Nintendo Switch and other consoles, it was still rumored for many years, but until, of course, after Harold Ramis passed away, well, we all know what we got. But then after that, they realized they made a mistake and then gave us Ghostbusters Afterlife, which I think was a very welcome third movie. It would have been great to see Harold Ramis come back as his respectable role, but I think they did the right thing by bringing him back as a ghost and honoring him in a very heartwarming and rather tear-jerking manner. I mean, they did a great job in dedication to him. And they brought, of course, the original cast back, but of course not till the end of the movie. It was kind of abrupt and everything like that. But I could see they did it right with a lot of Easter eggs and, of course, new characters, which are, well, as you know, the grandchildren of Egon Spangler. So they obviously wanted to pass the torch on to a new generation, and they did a pretty damn good job. I mean, the music was great, it was silly, it was funny. A bit of an Easter egg movie, but again, nothing's ever going to top the first movie. So, of course, with the mid and end credit scene especially, where Janine and Winston make an appearance as they bring the Ecto-1 back into the firehouse, and in what better city than New York, where it all started, leading up to this film. With the same cast, Carrie Coon and Paul Rudd as, well, I guess the parents of Phoebe, who basically takes after Egon Spangler, not only with the looks, but of course the science-y stuff, played by McKenna Gray, she kills it once again, and, well, of course, Finn Wolfhart, playing her older brother, Trevor, and, well, as you know, they're all in the ghost-busting business. But things are a little bit different, being that they're in New York City, and, of course, the older cast from the older movies come back. You got Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Ernie Hudson, Annie Potts, and even Walter Peck. Yeah, that's right. That guy who tried to put the Ghostbusters down in the first movie as the EPA representative is somehow mayor of New York City. Wow. But pretty much he's the same kind of character in this movie as he was in the first. He has the same intention on putting the Ghostbusters down and calling them frauds. So those are some things that haven't changed a bit. And after hearing somewhat mixed to rather negative reception, I can't say I had high expectations on this movie. I mean, I went in with rather fair expectations, and I got what I expected. It was good for some parts. Okay, well, again, there's going to be some spoilers in this, so if you don't want any, once again, turn the video off right now. I like the whole Frozen Empire idea. I like how it starts out back in the early 1900s and showing the Ghostbusters firehouse, you know, before cars were invented and everything like that, and the whole backstory with the Frozen Empire, how it all comes from a little artifact. And, well, here are some things. Yes, the movie is very busy. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of characters in this, and there's a lot of story going on in this, because, like I said, they have new characters that are trying to pass on the new torch to, as well as the old characters that they're still trying to really fit in there. So that's a lot to put in. Dan Aykroyd is the one who gets the most screen time, while Bill Murray is in there for one scene at the beginning and then, well, doesn't come back till the very end of the movie. Annie Potts, of course, doesn't come back until the end, even though she does make an appearance at the beginning as well. You got a couple of scenes with Ernie Hudson. 
But then he also got some newcomers, like Patton Oswalt from King of Queens. His character is pretty funny. You got this new guy, and he actually plays a key role in this as, well, kind of the fire master or something with the history of the Frozen Empire. It's all very fascinating and everything, but here's the real thing with this movie. You don't really see the Frozen Empire yet. You expect to, after seeing the trailer for this movie, you know, seeing New York City all frozen up and everything like that, you expect this to be the whole entire movie, but here's the big downside of it that, at least in my opinion, was the downside. You don't really get that, the whole city and everything freezing up, until like the last 30 minutes of the movie. It's mostly build-up. Yeah, most of the time, which isn't a bad thing, but there are some parts that can drag a little bit. Like I said, it's a little overstuffed. You got Phoebe, who's trying to become a Ghostbuster, but her parents are like, you're just a kid, you got the rest of your life, you gotta wait till you're a little bit more grown up. You got Finn Wolfhard, who's basically just about there, and of course he's trying to catch Slimer. So there, there's a lot of Easter eggs in here that you'll notice as a diehard Ghostbuster fan, and yeah, Slimer makes the return, you got things that you probably remember from the real Ghostbusters animated series, like the lion statue in front of the New York Public Library coming to life. Well, it wasn't exactly like that. That was more of in front of somebody's house, but I couldn't help but think of that episode, as well as any Potts becoming a Ghostbuster at the end of the movie. McKenna Grace's character is fascinating and everything with all the sciencey stuff, but, but she ends up talking to this ghost character, which... I don't mind. I mean, you do feel some sympathy for her, being that she was killed at a young age and she can't move on. But I feel like this part of the movie kind of drags it on a little too much. I mean, there's one scene where she's playing chess with her, and then there's another scene where she's sent out to catch the ghost, which happens to be her, inside of a diner. She doesn't want to do it because she feels sympathy for her, and she's all about fire and everything like that. There is a little padding in this film that is kind of a little excessive, even for a movie that's only about two hours in runtime. You got, of course, that same kid podcast from the last movie who makes a return. You got, of course, Trevor's girlfriend, Lucky, making a return, this time joining the team as a Ghostbuster. And aside from the Firemaster and Patton Oswalt's character, you got this other newcomer who's basically in a new containment, which I like this part of the movie, how they realize there's too much ghost inside of the firehouse that they do get back. And basically, they build a new containment area miles away with this newcomer. And his character is very fascinating of how they experiment on all the ghosts and everything like that. They keep them in a lockup. Like you got the one ghost who manages to get out, the one that you can't see but takes possession of all inanimate objects and everything like that. And you got, of course, that one little artifact that they happen to get inside of Rates of Cult Shop. Yeah, that same shop from the second movie, and of course, it was seen in the last movie, Afterlife. And again, in this movie, where he's experimenting on all these weird little ghostly artifacts. So yeah, it seems like I'm talking about a lot here. And that's what this movie kind of feels like. There's a lot going on leading up to the big finish, which is what you'd expect to see out of this movie. And... Yeah, if you could take it, that's understandable. I understand critics were very overreactive on this, and they said there's just a lot going on in it, and I feel that, that same way too. But for the most part, maybe that's what it needed. It's tough to really do this kind of series justice, putting in new characters as well as bringing back the original. It worked on some levels, but I feel like maybe it was just a little too much. But once it gets down to the action with, of course, the proton packs, and, of course, how they take out that evil ice queen, or whatever they call it, with the death chill, it's really good. But again, like I said, you don't really see that until, like, the last 30 minutes of the movie. So that's probably my biggest flaw and gripe I have to say about this movie. Other than that, it's good, considering it's not directed by Jason Reitman this time. And yet, at the end credits, just like the last movie with... Harold Ramis, this one does the same for Ivan Reitman. May he rest in peace, of course. Thank you for giving us the really classic first movie, as well as the equally entertaining, but maybe not as good as the first one, second film. And, well, that's all I could say there. It's funny. It's silly. You expect a lot of quirky dialogue, which you get a lot of, especially out of Carrie Coon and Paul Rudd's character. And it's great to see the new cast back, 
as well as the old cast that are working in together. May seem like a little bit of a mess and a lot going on, but I think it was enjoyable enough. It did pretty damn good at the box office, and once again, it put that 2016 abomination to shame. I mean, it's nowhere near as bad as that film. I mean, anything could be better than that. But it was a good continuation. I'm not sure if they're going to make any more sequels. And yes, there is, of course, a mid credit scene, which is, well, silly and not really necessary, like it's hinting anything coming up in the future. There's nothing after the credits, like after life had. Otherwise, that's all I have to say there. It's Ghostbusters. It's a sequel. It's good. May not be the best in the franchise, but I can't say I really expected it to be. I saw it in Dolby. I enjoyed it for what it was, but I think I'd rather go back to watching the previous three. But otherwise, I give it just a plain two ear remotes up. It's a typical sequel. Enjoy it for what it is. Don't go in with crazy high expectations. That's about it. So, the next film, well, let me get suited up once again for the finale. Godzilla X-Kong. That's right, my most anticipated movie of 2024, the sequel to Godzilla vs. Kong. That's right, when two worlds collided. After being hinted it with Godzilla 2014, as well as its sequel, Godzilla King of the Monsters, and the 2017 Kong Skull Island. So... Both monsters met. We got a pretty good movie back in 2021, which was, of course, delayed after the COVID pandemic. And even during its release, it was released simultaneously to streaming because things weren't exactly 100% back to normal. And that's what I ended up watching it on, on HBO Max, which, well, now is Max. But now it's only released in theaters since pretty much everything's back to normal. Most people are going back to theaters. And, well, I went to see this bad boy in theaters. And I can safely say, I had a good time. Once again, receiving rather mixed reactions like the last couple of movies in the franchise. Hey, we just want to see giant monsters fight and kick the shit out of each other. And for what it was, I thoroughly enjoyed this one. Yeah, it's not an Oscar-worthy movie. I agree with that. I mean, it's nothing like Godzilla Minus One, which was a masterpiece, but... Basically, it's in the MonsterVerse, unlike that one, which is more or less its own thing. Yeah, this one continues the story with Kong, if you saw the last movie, Living in Hollow Earth, which is kind of a strange, obscure place. You got the main characters, some making a return, like Rebecca Hall, as the adopted mother of the deaf native girl, who's actually trying to fit into the real world. I mean, she's struggling and everything like that. What do you expect? She's more or less a fish out of water. She was taken from her home, and as you remember in the last movie, she has the connections with Kong. You know, she's able to talk to him using sign language, and she somehow knows something's going on in the Hollow Earth. And yeah, once again, spoiler alert if you haven't seen this movie, it's fairly new. But yeah, she basically knows something's going on, and there's a new threat and, well, not only we got Kong, but also Godzilla, who's on the surface world, taking out and kicking the shit and annihilating all different monsters across the world. I mean, this part of the movie's pretty awesome. Of course, it's going to be a lot of CG in it, as expected. A lot of landmarks getting destroyed. He goes to sleep inside of the Colosseum in Rome. Yeah, it's a little bit silly, but that's what we want to see. We want to see the monsters. As I said, Rebecca Hall and the native girl as well as the podcaster from the last movie. Yeah, there's no Millie Bobby Brown or Kyle Chandler. Not disappointed at all. Again, it's all about the monsters. That's what we want to see. And you do got Dan Stevens' character. You've probably seen him in a bunch of other films. He's more or less the monster animal expert. He gives Kong a new tooth and everything like that, and tries to look out for him because, you know, he's looking out for the rest of the world even though he's living in the hollow earth, and there's someone down there, and yeah, the effects are what you'd expect. If you've seen the last movie, they use the same sort of technology and everything like that, and they come across a lot of hidden surprises, as well as a native civilization down there. So they're basically bringing that little girl back to her home, where she fits in. I mean, it's tough for her to really adopt to the real world, going to school and everything like that. Like I said, she's a fish out of water. 
and they basically uncover all sorts of secrets, as well as a new foe, which, if you saw in the trailer, is that evil Kong. Yeah, you see a whole bunch of new ones, as well as a little mini Kong, that try to take on the main Kong himself, you know, the king. And that's where the war pretty much breaks out. And it's not only him with the big thing on his shoulder, which looks like a bunch of gun bullets. It's actually a new menacing type of lizard that breathes cold air and starts a new ice age. I'm not sure if it's a coincidence that this is yet another movie released a week after the Ghostbusters movie, which also deals with the new Ice Age. Yeah, I think that was pretty much. And, yeah, so that's what they have to deal with. Basically, this evil Kong controls this lizard, and they realize that Kong cannot fight him on his own. So, what do you know? He's back teaming up with Godzilla himself, who's ravaging the world, and he knows that shit's about to go down. And, yeah, you get a ton load of fight scenes on the Hollow Earth, but most importantly on the surface world. I mean, that's what you come to see. Like I said, it's not a masterpiece movie. There's a lot of silly moments in this, you know, especially out of the podcaster. There's a lot of focus on those characters too as well. But I'm glad to see that the monsters get a lot more screen time. That's what you come to see. The podcaster's a real excited one, as well as the animal expert who fixes things up a lot better, gives Kong that much-needed upgrade by fixing his arm. Yeah, if you've seen it in the trailer, you know what to expect with it. And I love the music soundtrack that they include with this movie. I mean, that's a definite nice touch, especially with the Kiss song that they added in. I mean, that definitely makes it a more rockin' good time. So, again, this is a real leave-your-brain-behind and just enjoy a good mindless amount of fights and action. Just enjoy it for what it is. It's a sequel to a franchise that is just mind-blowing as ever. You want to see, like I said, monsters kicking the shit out of each other with some real incredible sound effects. Again, just like Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, I did see this one in Dolby. No complaints there. It just looked and sounded amazing. So, overall, I can safely say that for just under a two-hour runtime, I was thoroughly entertained with this one. Again, it's not a masterpiece, it's not going for an Oscar, but if you're looking for some real kick-ass monster size action with some landmarks and everything getting destroyed, then you'll get your kicks with this one. But if you're expecting a masterpiece, well, I think you're just going to have to look in a different direction. Like I said, it's mindless, but it's fun. And I enjoyed the hell out of it. So, monster size action, deserving of a monstrous we remote we motion plus up and the plane we remote up. Not much to say there. So, thus concludes my three movie March Madness review. Till next time, keep watching.